simple then um i'm seeing this as a follow-on from paul bledders um paul who gave the presentation oh was it back in the last year beginning of this year about what's going on in ufology so this is a kind of alternative to that effectively paul did a really good overview of the things that are coming from the ufo community the things that people in ufology are very excited about like the pentagon hearings um this is a kind of alternative it's a look at an argument um, I think is actually very pertinent. My suggestion would be that some of the best ufologists, i.e. people who investigate UFOs, are not always ufologists. In fact, some of the people I'm going to be talking about tonight might be surprised, possibly even a little bit horrified to see themselves included in this uh, particular presentation. But it's a kind of, um, I don't know, I describe this as a polemic. Uh, I'm writing a book chapter on this very thing this week actually going through the, the the presentation tonight and i've described the book that i'm doing at the moment as a kind of polemic it's a bit of a rant about a lifetime spent obsessed with ufos and things that i've learned which include in my humble opinion the fact that some of the most meaningful contributions have been made to the to ufology by people who never set out to be ufologists in the first place so one thing i'd like you to do tonight Stuart, um just on the third slide, if you could get back to me with tell me what people are posting, because the first question is this. Um, there's a I can't see this because there's a bar of um, people's webcams and stuff to the right. But effectively, somebody not in not that far in the past, I mean, a few decades ago, said if ever there's a subject that needs rescuing from its own supporters, it's this one, i.e., Somebody said that about ufology. I'd be interested to know if any of the people watching tonight either know who it is or have got a good guess about who actually said that. Yeah, but I think it's quite pertinent. I think that to a certain extent, if ufology doesn't need rescuing from its own supporters, it's often in need of help. Um, and the good reasons for thinking that. This is a Wikipedia definition of ufology. Uh, the investigation of unidentified flying objects, as you can see there, by people who believe that they may be of extraordinary origins, i.e. basically most of the people Wikipedia identifies as investigating UFOs have got an idea in their own head that they're looking for evidence of extraterrestrial alien visitors. Yeah, um, people like governments do investigate it. And certainly in terms of, say, for example, defence significance, if something unlikely is detected in the atmosphere then often governments do take a an investigation of it i've mentioned before when i've been doing presentations that uh i was in a group called ufopra east anglian ufo and paranormal research association back in the 80s and 90s and one of my fellow members was a guy called ralph noise and ralph was quite active in the ufo community until he died at the end of the last century um he'd been very senior in the Ministry of Defence. When he retired, he had the rank of Under Secretary. So effectively, his security clearance was up to and including briefing cabinet ministers. And he was quite forthcoming about a lot of things. One thing he would quite happily tell people was that in his tenure in the MOD, which went from 1946 to 1977, um, he'd known his employers get excited about UFOs three times. Specifically, the event in Operation Main Brace in 1952, the Bentwaters incident of 1956 and the Tehran incident of 1976. And in all cases, they weren't excited about the fact that they were dealing with extraterrestrial visitors. They were excited about the fact, i.e. they'd got worried about the fact that things had gone on in the atmosphere, which had brought about a situation where they thought that they might be under attack and subsequently turned out not to be. So consequently, the concern in that level of investigation, the MOD level of investigation into UFOs, was that we might misinterpret some natural phenomena and accidentally go to war or something along those lines. Um, so 
there are serious investigations. People like the MOD have investigated. People like Ralph Noyes have shared this. And by and large, not because they think they're dealing with extraterrestrials, but because there might be other very good reasons why you'd need to investigate it. So before we go to slide three, Stu, has anybody posted thinking that they know the identity of the person who said that ufology was the subject that needed rescuing from its own supporters? The only person who's posted is Rob Gandhi. And to be honest, I agree with him when he said John Keel. You will be surprised. John Keel probably thought that. The guy who said it was Timothy Good. <laughs> really? No shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> irony upon irony. <laughs> right. And I, I've been quoting this in live talks and stuff like that. Not so much recently, but um, I used to quote this back at the end of the last century in live talks. And... I can't remember how many times. I mean, it was a significant number of times people came up to me and said I'd made it up. It was a lie. It's not. Um, Guardian G2, 9th of May, 1996, page four. It's in front of you there at the moment. OK. Um, now, if you're going to be a cynic, <laughs> maybe Timothy Good said that to The Guardian because he was trying to say what he thought The Guardian would want to hear about UFOs because the fact that The Guardian had decided to go and cover him and... At this point, Timothy Good was promoting the huge selling book Above Top Secret. So um, he would have very good reasons to say the right things to the right journalists. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not personally acquainted with Timothy Good to the point where I could ask him what he meant by saying that. But I have a hunch he was probably telling the truth. Um, I saw him speak quite a few times over the years. And because he was doing public lectures on UFOs, he was attracting everybody and he was i mean this is the days before the internet really but um he used to get i mean i know this from the same thing happens to me that you, you go and do a webinar somewhere particularly in the united states uh, and then you get all manner of emails through you you know people get back to you i mean in my case they come through my yeah. so just a simple one why would i agree with timothy good well because once i went on quite a popular webinar in the united states i made the point that i didn't think that roswell the roswell incident included was anything to do with alien spacecraft mm -hmm. um the first guy that rang in called me a moron and uh you know i was i was fielding emails about well you're obviously a government agent i don't want to deal with you you know <laughs> um so you know there, there, there are some people have very, very set opinions and don't like them being challenged within ufology. I think Timothy Good was talking about the number of people he'd encountered and thinking if only there was more significant investigation. That's the opening rant over. I'm going to suggest 10 people or types of people who might have made a contribution to our understanding of UFOs if we look at their work in the right way. And none of these people, first and foremost, is a ufologist. Some of them have little active interest in the paranormal, as ASAP would understand it. And effectively, this is a polemic. So I'd be interested in people's opinions at the end of it. But like with all the webinars I, I, I give, I will do my level best here to show you book covers, give you names, stuff that you can Google later on. OK. Number one, then, I think there's a case to be made for the fact that some of the best contributions have been made by skeptics and i would hold up skeptoid the podcast as probably a very very good example of this specifically brian dunning if you're unfamiliar with this brian dunning has been presenting skeptoid since 2006 usually he takes that the standard skeptoid is that it doesn't run for any more than 20 minutes they take one paranormal claim or conspiracy theory claim or similar uh, usually he will start by saying that it will start by sharing the story, you know, the, the lurid, vivid, well-told story that most people believe, at which point it is normally Skeptoid's job to demolish the thing within the running time. So if, if, if they can't demolish it in 20 minutes, which normally they can do, they will demolish it in two episodes. Um, and to give you some parameters of Skeptoid, it's sceptical, but it's sceptical in a... Um, it's sceptical in a very credible way. Uh, one thing Skeptoid does that most, for example, the UFO programs you'll see on the History Channel tend not to do. Skeptoid makes all its sources available at the end. So you can you can literally go and check all the peer reviewed stuff and everything that he talks about. Um, when Skeptoid deals with something that is truly incredible, it often demolishes it from the start. So they made an exception with the 
the episode on whether Elvis is still alive. <laughs> I don't think he'd been going two minutes before he said, no, just it's just totally improbable. Elvis is dead, get over it. But by the same token, Skeptoid, um, when they're presented with something that they can't demolish, they're honest about it. So when Brian Dunning was promoting his UFO movie, They Don't Want You to See, which came out in 2023, there was a lengthy interview on the Squaring the Strange podcast. And Brian Dunning, whilst he was very sceptical about a lot of big UFO claims, so is that movie, for example, does a fair job of demolishing both the... Uh, the school sightings in uh, Zimbabwe, which John Mack investigated, the IE aliens in the playground. And it also his movie does a pretty good job of trying to demolish the Rendlesham Forest case as well. But during the promotion of that movie, the first excitement about the exoplanet K218b, which appears to have a biosignature, i.e., if you're unfamiliar with this, it's worth a Google. It's a planet three times the size of Earth, covered in water. It may be the first place that we detect extraterrestrial life and it's interesting there's quite a lot of excitement about it at the end of last year and things got very active online briefly in the UK because Maggie um, Maggie Aderin Pocock was in the audience at Jules Holland, Holland's Hootenanny at the end of last year and Jules Holland asked her for a prediction for 2024 and she indicated that we might know that we're not alone in the cosmos <laughs> which threw Jules Holland for a second there was all sorts of stuff I saw online after that about, oh, my God, they're going to, you know, they're going to open up the hangar and show us. Um, and I think what Maggie Adair and Pocock was referring to is that astronomers are aware that they're slowly but surely going through all the possibilities for this particular planet. And it keeps coming back with findings that suggest there might be uh, life on it. I'm, but, and we're talking simple life that lives in water. So we're not about to start talking to them. And similarly, Brian Dunning has been honest enough to say that the wow signal could be anything there's an episode on that that said if you want to see why ufology is known as a pseudoscience pseudosciences and i'll throw a few things out here if you want to go and google them um you can still find online an essay that was written in 1979 called the failure of the science of ufology it was written by james oberg who's still around he was then a nasa scientist these days he's better known as a journalist and it won a prize. Uh, it won a cash prize offered by Cutty Sark Whiskey, which was in tandem with New Scientist magazine for a, an article on UFOs. And James Oberg wrote a, science, a, a paper called The Failure of the Science of Ufology. And he just demolished the investigative standards by which most ufology operates. Um, and I followed this up 20 years later with a paper in the Fortean Studies series of books, the annual Fortean Studies series of books, just looking at whether anything had significantly changed since James Oberg won his, um, his prize with Cutty Sark Whiskey. My conclusion was not really that there's things that scientists would call residue fallacies, confirmation bias, all the stuff happens the whole time. Brian Dunning is always calling ufology out on that and sometimes in great amounts. So... By Skeptoid standards, three episodes on one subject is most the most they've ever done. And he took three episodes to absolutely demolish ancient aliens. Yeah. I hear literally things like if they can't tell whether you say Mayan or Maya, as in describing a group of people, if their standards are so low that they get that wrong, how can you trust anything, particularly when they locate you know, found artifacts moved from one country to another? They claim it was found in Peru when it was really dug up in Brazil that kind of thing and also more recently he did a double episode on the rogues gallery taking over america i.e robert bigelow and his cohorts of you know the, the people like chris mellon that turn up on you know and louis elizondo who turn up on a number of documentaries and he just went into their political influence the so-called peer-reviewed papers they produced that actually didn't aren't peer-reviewed papers and weren't taken seriously by science and stuff like that so i think some of the best contributions are made by skeptics for no other reason than they hold the findings of ufology up to professional often peer-reviewed standards and find it wanting uh and you know the the old adage extraordinary claims need extraordinary proof if you can't measure things you've got very little and people like brian dunning i think matter in this context that's the logo from his movie last year if you've never seen it i would recommend that you see it it's a pretty low budget documentary 
it's not the best in terms of like what a lot of it is just him talking to people who know stuff but on the other hand it's very intelligent talking and i would just we'll come to this later on but that's um the thing you're looking at on the left there is um some of the graffiti art of a guy called cat neil he's the isle of thanet's answer to banksy um yeah seriously and all his graffiti is about aliens it, it's they're they're grinning blissful cats there's some suggestion of drug involvement here but he, he tends to populate his graffiti with ufos and little missives about the way the world is um i met him once it was <laughs> it's one of these things where you obviously like banksy you can't just ring the guy up and you know you can't you can't just walk into his house or something like that but friend of a friend i actually managed to find a way of getting the message to him along the lines of i'd really like to meet you because i'm going to use one of your art pieces in a book i'm writing um and he's kind of hidden in plain sight so i'll give i'll tell you two things he's male and he's hidden in plain sight that's probably all i'm allowed to say about him but again he's in a sense he's holding things he's looking at it from the other way like a lot of creative artists they're telling you what it feels like and the kind of you know hunches they've got about it and asking you to to take this seriously we'll come to whether creative artists have a role to play in our understanding of ufology in India of course secondly I think this particular lady might be making more of a contribution than people realize and I don't see her mentioned in any of the paranormal literature uh, if you watch her TEDx talk, she pronounces her surname correctly. Apologies, but um, a name like Villaroel or however you pronounce it was not made to be said with a West Cumbrian accent. Um, she is what I'm saying here. Professor of Physics at Stock, Assistant Professor of Physics at Stockholm University. And actually, she's doing something very, very simple. There is a TEDx talk on her website where you can see her talking about this in, in some detail for about 12 minutes. But she knows like a lot of people who are involved in physics astronomy whatever satellites and objects in earth orbit leave particular distinctive types of trails across the sky so here is a fairly obvious thing to do which ufologists haven't done so it's it's left to her to do it if you go looking at photographs of the night sky of which there are loads over the last century and particularly since the Second World War, and you look before the 4th of October 1957, i.e. you look at these before we had any objects that were man-made in Earth orbit, and you see satellite trails, pardon my phone, I'm just going to ignore that, um, and you see satellite trails, then that might be quite interesting. Now, she's the, a couple of things, and she does talk about this on the TED Talk. Give me a second, I'm just going to knock that off. That's some text scammer. All right, apologies for that. Um, but she's found um, nine sources on one plate from April 1950, for example, which is intriguing. I mean, she's she's got a fairly pragmatic explanation for it, which is that it might be um, to do with a, a nuclear test, i.e. basically fallout from the nuclear test might be um, turning up on the plate. But alternatively, it might be something significant. One thing that's also on the night of the 19th of July 1952, um, there is a one plate that shows three bright stars that have since vanished, that three bright sources of light. That might be just totally random. But the interesting thing about that from a ufological point of view is that it coincides with the first of the two infamous Washington overflights, um, which were... In the 1950s, people don't talk about this case particularly these days, but in the 1950s, um, if you look at the sci-fi movies and stuff like that that were around at the time, things like The Day the Earth Stood Still were the best guess about how the then flying saucer craze would play out, because at that point it looked like we were dealing with, the popular opinion was we were dealing with super intelligent aliens in craft that we could just about understand that were just several generations ahead of the things that we were building and movies like the day the earth stood still presented intelligent aliens landing like that well not long after that those kind of movies started being made there were two consecutive saturday nights when washington dc was overflown by mass ufos um it's widely taken as the americans did, did this did deliberately as in it was a 
covert operation from America, basically, and that they'd done this deliberately to make people more aware of flying saucers because they wanted the population, i.e. the general public, scanning the stars. And they wanted that because their radar coverage, particularly on the coast near places like Oregon, was so lacking that if Soviet, any kind of Soviet hardware was infiltrating from uh, the west coast of America, there were places on the coast that they wanted the civil the, the citizens to spot it because they hadn't got radar coverage. That's all you'll find that in some of the more skeptical UFO books. So it's interesting. She found some traces that seemed to correspond to the Washington overflights, which suggested there might have been something there. Uh, you'll hear her say in a TEDx talk, there's no astronomical explanation for this type of event. She's still looking, but she's making a contribution to ufology in a very almost like basic, just grunt hard graft just looking after you know the her, her and her team are looking at slide after slide to try and spot things that might be of some significance so don't know if, you, if you've read this guy's book if if anybody's not up on ufology and wants to get up on ufology i would thoroughly recommend the book i'm going to show you on the next slide but another area of contribution i think that various people have come in and made over the years is that Whilst the subject sells books and produces documentaries and endless amounts of stuff online, the number of serious journalists, i.e. people who arrive with their credibility and go looking for their own subject that have tackled UFOs is minimal, to say the least. So a lot of serious writers will go to something like politics, even sports, in search of the stories that will make better stories than the public think basically you know i.e the good investigative journalists will go and find things you know they'll find corruption in sports where other people just see sport there are one or two cdb brian who wrote a book on ufology in the 1990s for example attended a very unusual conference at massachusetts institute of technology and pretty much got his book out of it and it was an unusual conference because it was the best academics and the best ufo researchers coming together there were times it was absolutely fierce, fractious and whatever. There were times it was actually more convivial than you'd think. But Garrett Graff, who's amongst other things, as it says there, um, was a Pulitzer Prize finalist writing a book about Watergate, did a huge book on ufology last year. This one, right? And when I say huge, it is huge. If you want to listen to it, that's 18 hours and 16 minutes of your life you won't get back. Although it might be worth it. Um, it's 554 pages in the hardback. It's loads and loads of good reviews. With all due respect to the Seriously Strange Weekend and how wonderful we all are when we get together, I don't think we have a hope in hell of attracting Garrett Graff. I think if if he goes to, you know, if, if subjects that attract him are things like Watergate, i.e. let's revisit that, he's the kind of journalist who thinks he's in the Woodward and Bernstein tradition. You know, he wants to write for the most reputable publications and deal with the deepest subjects. Interestingly, his UFO book does more or less what you'd think. It puts side by side the amateur investigations into UFOs and things like SETI, the serious scientific investigations into UFOs. And obviously it holds the pros and cons of both of them up. So it's it's scathing. There are if you're a believer in the main you the main planks of popular ufology if you think an alien spacecraft crashed in roswell you're not going to have a lot of fun reading gareth garrett graff's assessment of it because he doesn't believe that and he calls out you know all the hoaxes he calls out the he's merciless sometimes about the big cases like gulf breeze that the world and his dog were obliged to believe at some point and then they crashed and burned but it's interesting in terms of the contribution he makes. He certainly holds it up to very high standards in terms of trying to make sense of the whole thing. Two things that came out of it for me were that, first of all, he's a lot less scathing about the so-called new ufology than you might think. So the kind of you know, the people like uh, Jacques Vallée who see ufology as um, some kind of paranormal occurrences on the almost on the fringes of understood physics i.e 
there might be other kinds of intelligences trying to uh, try to contact us in ways we barely begin to understand. Garrett Graff doesn't seem to struggle with that. Um, whilst we can't know anything about it, um, it's amazing how well that approach comes out of it. And he's going to this as a serious, critically thinking journalist in the same way that he would attack the aftermath of the Watergate scandal, for example. Um, the you know other times like i say he's a bit scathing so he you know he he points out let's go back to gulf breeze for a second he has quite a bit to say about that and the fact that um mufon who were the biggest ufo investi investigative organization in the united states at the time of gulf breeze there was pretty much a three-line whip amongst mufon members that they were obliged to believe this um and he points out, which I hadn't realised, that one of the good things about Gulf Breeze for MUFON was that their, their membership quadrupled. <laughs> so no wonder they were behind it. Um, you know, but it's, uh, the point I'd make is that when serious investigative writers come to a paranormal subject, we might have good reason to welcome them, even if on the first run through reading their stuff, you feel very uncomfortable. All right, let's talk about some hoaxes. Uh Again, this might be an unpopular opinion. People who hoax paranormal events lead paranormal investigators to waste a lot of time and get excited and occasionally make fools of themselves. So they're not the most welcome individuals. Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley. So Doug on the left, Dave on the right. These are the guys that hoaxed a lot of crop circles. They pretty much started the whole thing. I think it was Doug, the one on the left, who originally lived in, he lived in Australia. These two were artists and good mates for a number of years. And Doug, pretty sure it was Doug, lived in Australia where there had been flattened areas of grass discovered. They were known as saucer nests, because back in the 1960s, when people still talked about flying saucers, when these big areas were found, it became a popular belief among some people that they were places where flying saucers, i.e. UFOs, had landed. So Doug was the main instigator in terms of getting them out into the cornfields and doing it. But the point, a few points I'd make about Doug and Dave. First of all, their hoaxing did hold up to ridicule some of the people that eventually became quite big players in crop circles. First of all, because one fact was hidden in plain sight doug and dave were fond of a drink on a friday night and you know the, the pubs going back to when they first started doing this it was still the days when the pubs closed quite early so they tended to follow a few points with oaks in a circle um whilst a lot of people got excited about the circles one of the things that was hidden in plain sight was that these things tended to appear overnight between friday and saturday which kind of was a bit of a giveaway, really. Um, I mean, obviously, they didn't hoax all the circles. What happened was it all got out of hand and other people hoaxed much more complicated circles than Doug and Dave hoaxed. But there are a number of hoaxes in there. So let's let's give a few honourable mentions to a few other people. When hoaxing is exposed, it teaches us something about how credulous some of the people who believe certain claims of the paranormal are. If we learn from that, it's great. If we don't learn from it, we're bound to repeat the same mistakes effectively. So as I say there, there's too many hoaxes in, in ufology. There are too many hoaxes to, to pick. But basically, Ed Walters, responsible for the Gulf Breeze sightings. Well, in the end, he did a lot of damage to belief in photographic UFO cases and to the notion that an invest a group that calls itself an investigative group should ever put a three-line whip on its members to get them all to agree to the same thing. Um, so in that sense, Ed Walters did ufology a favour, albeit a lot of people in ufology didn't think so then and don't think so now. You're looking at the cover, the front cover of Cedric Allingham's Flying Saucer from Mars. On the right, you're looking at a picture of Cedric Allingham. If you don't know that story, it's an absolute bloody riot. And I would thoroughly recommend the entertainment value thereof. But I'll tell you the gist of it. In the wake of George Adamski's best-selling contribution to Flying Sources of Landed in 1953, if you're unfamiliar with this, Flying Sources of Landed is, by and large, a serious, reputable book about the history of UFO sightings going back years. That bit of the book, the serious reputable bit was written by a guy called Desmond Leslie, who's hugely underrated in terms of his contribution, because what's best known about the book 
is that the last section was written by George Adamski and it claimed that he met a Venusian in the desert in California. And George Adamski became the most celebrated contactee of all. Shortly after that, Cedric Allingham produced a book called Flying Saucer from Mars, where effectively the same story turned up in the UK, except the alien encountered was a Martian. The whole thing is a hoax. The picture of Cedric Allingham on the right is actually a guy called Peter Davis. The main instigator, other than Peter Davis, who fronted it and did one lecture, was Patrick Moore, uh, who denied it to the end of his life and threatened legal action on people like Jenny Randalls when they'd figured out that it was it was his work. But bottom line is, you go and check it out online now. Patrick Moore was absolutely behind this, an arch debunker of UFO cases. I might mention this earlier on, but when George King, Sir George King, as he later became, albeit not, not, not knighted by our own royal family, um, he founded the Aetherius Society UFO religion. And in his early days, one of the things he did was to turn up and channel an alien intelligence on a stage in London. Um, as a way of recruiting members to his growing group, the Aetherius Society. And on one famous in, uh, event, he was on stage saying that he would answer any question. The, you know, these super intelligent beings would answer, the master of Aetherius would answer any question from an earthling about the way the world is. And Patrick Moore asked a question, but he asked it in Norwegian. I didn't know this, but he spoke fluent Norwegian. And of course, despite being able to answer any question from any earthling, the master of theories couldn't speak Norwegian. It was a very difficult moment. Um, Patrick Moore was a debunker, and we owe him quite a bit because he was, um, you know, he, 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 would hold he would hold things up to ridicule when they were asking for it. So too, incidentally, the infamous Cradle Hill UFO hoax of 1970, i.e. the team that hoaxed Flying Saucer Review, my, my bad, it was not the late 60s, it was actually 1970. But effectively, a group of sceptics put a stooge in a sky-watching team on Cradle Hill just outside of Warminster in Wiltshire. And they set up a whole UFO hoax, which Flying Saucer Review fell for. And, you know, Flying Saucer Review liked to present things in a sort of pseudo-scientific way, so it did them no favours. We'll, we'll skip over Bill Moore, other than to say that Philip Klass, the uh, arch-American sceptic. Bill Moore was a hugely active guy in, in ufology. He was central to the claims of the MJ-12 document. It was Philip Klass who sussed an idiosyncratic use of apostrophes in the MJ-12 documents and realised that the only other place he'd seen apostrophes used in dates like this was in correspondence with Bill Moore. Um, so again... You know, one of the most celebrated UFO cases crushed and burned for want of detail. I said we'd get back to um, Chris is offline, isn't he? It? Yeah. It's a shame because this is a kind of follow up to the um, the rock music thing he did a while ago. Only this is a bit more idiosyncratic. I think there's something to be said for the way that. Um, people in the entertainment industry have shaped our views of ufology. They don't always see themselves as ufologists. They often run with ideas of ufology in creative and individual ways. And I'm just gonna, I'm going to hold out one here as an absolute extreme example, because in one sense, this is a guy in plain sight just taking it as far as his imagination will go, albeit he's claiming this is the real thing, but so therefore he's a case study. He's a case study of what happens when people become absolutely convinced of something that is very difficult to prove in any kind of rational scientific or social scientific way. If you're unfamiliar with this guy, I would thoroughly recommend that you check out what I'm about to show you now, because apart from anything else, it'll be like nothing else you've ever encountered recently. Kimberly Barrington Frost, those are the dates of, the, of, of his birth and death, basically. But he was known as Ramesses. Um, his professional background was, as it says there, I mean, <laughs> he was doing the point I'm making about him being a central heating salesman in Scotland. If you're selling central heating in Scotland in the late 1960s, to be brutally honest, you're on a meal ticket. That's a nation that's crying out for it at the time. You cannot possibly go wrong. Uh, for all that, he decided that that was not his calling. And this is the story, you know, a vision from the Egyptian pharaoh god Ramesses, right? Telling him that he was actually the reincarnation of Ramesses and his duty was to inform the world and the truth about the universe. And the way he was to do it was via rock music. 
seriously if you're interested in any kind of asap 40 and rock you owe it to yourself to listen to these albums particularly the top one space hymns um I'm quoting from my own book there, apologies, but that last point on there, um, I wrote a book called 500 Albums You Won't Believe Until You Hear Them, which is pretty much what you'd imagine it to be. Um, I promise you, I'd listened to 498 albums back to back. The only time I took a swerve was the Paramount Collection, which is just an unimaginably large amount of early 1978 collected by Jack White and released. And I will confess, I have not listened to every second of Johnny Cash reading the New Testament in its entirety. Yeah, but you can buy it. And if anybody was born to read the New Testament as an audio book, it's probably Johnny Cash. Um, everything else. But and this one is right up there with some of the strangest stuff you'll ever hear. Space Sims 1971, Glass Top, top Cop in 1975. And just pay attention to what you're looking at on the cover of Space Sims. That is a painting of the steeple of St. George's Church in Stockport, apparently blasting up. Amongst Ramesses beliefs was that church steeples were actually recreations of ancient astronaut rockets. I kid you not. Um, and apart from anything else, Space Hymns is worth investigating because it was recorded in Stro Strawberry Studios in Stockport uh, in 1971. The main four people that were hanging around Strawberry Studios and you know getting on with owning the place and forming their own band later went on to be the first lineup of 10cc. So the backing musicians are impeccable. You know, if it sounds like Eric Stewart on lead guitar, it is. <laughs> um, but the point I'm making here is that <clears throat> as somebody who professionally taught the media for decades and you know therefore taught people to be critical about it. And, you know, you're looking at what things that things that are denoted, things that are connoted, how we make meanings. Notions of alien intelligence, ufology, all the big ideas have played out massively in the popular media and all over the place. And, you know, my particular, my greatest interest of all these things would be rock music. And I could have found you loads of examples. I just deliberately picked two that are years apart. So on the left, you're looking at, uh, I think it's the second album by Eat Static. The first album's called Abduction, but Eat Static were a, what they called an ambient techno band, i.e. they'd be played at raves, but often in chill out rooms, uh, a bit like the Orb or something like that. But a lot of the, whilst it's all instrumental, uh, a lot of the stuff is based around, no, it's to, you're supposed to be in the headspace that helps you to contemplate things like ufology. Whereas on the right hand side, you've got um, one of many compilations of the kind of cheap throwaway kind of audio lo-fi trash rockabilly takes on flying saucers and aliens and stuff. Ramesses took it to another level. One or two other people over the years have done so. My argument crudely would be none of these people are ufologists, but if you think about how they shape minds and people's emotional responses they've made a bigger contribution sometimes than we give them credit for moving swiftly along I'm, apologies but i've banged on the last two times i've turned up on stage at the seriously strange weekend i've banged on about william james in fact note to self now whatever i do this this year don't don't put william james on the slide again um but william james you call him a psychologist, except that at the time that he was being a psychologist, there weren't psychologists. Um, his greatest contribution to our under the paranormal is probably his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. All right. Um, 1902. So it's a long, long time ago, but it's still a very relevant book. In fact, more so in, in curious ways, because the thing that William James it's a watershed moment for the paranormal, and therefore I would argue him into ufology, is that he was the first person to gather massive accounts of religious experience and codify them. Literally say, well, there are certain factors in mystical experiences, regardless of whether mystical experiences might apparently locate themselves according to the person having the experience. 
Um, so that's why it's the varieties of religious experience. You can have a mystical experience encountering a nature spirit. You can have a secular mystery, myst mystical experience because you just happen to be out in nature and it overwhelms you. It, you might be contacted by your deity, but that's not that's non-specific. You could be Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever. Mystical experiences, according to the Varieties of Religious Experience book 1902, are ineffable, i.e. they're beyond an easy definition. They're noetic. Some kind of knowledge is passed. It may be kind of nebulous. It may be that you just become more aware of the need to look after the earth, but you can't quite figure out exactly how you go about doing it. You just know it's important. But some kind of knowledge is passed. They're transient. So they're typically very, very brief experiences and they're passive, i.e. they most typically occur to somebody who's not trying to have a mystical experience. Now, from a ufological point of view, this is something I could bang on about it in a long time or I could simply say what I think is the main point, which is this, that the way I look at certainly UFO abduction experiences and a lot of the claimed contacts is that they fit better than people think this model of William James but they change over time so there's actually not a huge if you look at it from a mystical point of view there really isn't a very large difference between people who encountered fairies in the 18th century and people who are encountering encountering intelligent aliens now in fact there's an uncanny overlap a, a simple thing that is described in both instances for example is that any attempt to bring back an artifact from the other realm, whether it be fairy or alien, typically ends in failure, either because it's taken off you before you get it back or whatever you thought it was when you acquired it in the other realm. It just disintegrates physically or metaphorically when you bring it into this one. Um, so the wider point would be that people like William James give us a long view context of present paranormal claims and it may be that the underlying patterns are more consistent than the superficial patterns it, i think it's no accident that the more people encounter aliens the less they encounter nature spirits right it may be the same experiences we just understand them in a different way and to give you an argument about that there you've got william james's definitions these are all indicative of these little pictures are all indicative of infamous high strangeness UFO cases. Joe Simonton, top left, encountered a UFO and came away from it with a pancake because there was a griddle in the UFO. This is in the United States in 1961. The aliens on board the UFO had a griddle and they were cooking pancakes and they gave him one which was subsequently investigated. And you will not be surprised to discover that the investigation proved that it was a pancake. All right. He claimed alien origins. I don't know. Alfred Bertou fishing by a, the, the other photograph there, fishing by a canal bank in Aldershot, 12th of uh, August 1983. Um, Surrey UFO land, two beings come towards him. They come through a bush, so he can't see the UFO at this point and beckon him towards them. He goes on board the UFO. He can't see any living being around, but he hears a voice asking him how old he is. Um, he points out that he's coming up to his 70 eighth birthday at which point he's told he's too old and infirm for their purposes right so he goes back and starts fishing again and watches it take off you'll find that in one of timothy good's books his wife he didn't live very long after that his wife outlived him by a number of years and insisted to the end of her life that he didn't make it up and he was you know Alfred well, to had a tough old life i think i've talked about him before on webinars amongst other things he'd been a soldier and dodged bullets and he'd he'd trapped wild animals in Canada for their fur. So he wasn't the guy that scared easily. <laughs> and his wife said that really shook him up. The bomb picture is one of the drawings produced by Gene Hingley from Rowley Regis in the Midlands, uh, pertaining to a, an experience she had on the 4th of January, 1979. Something definitely happened to Gene Hingley because, or to her property, because there was a burnt circle in the snow it was a very cold winter. I don't know if anybody remembers the early days of 1979. I think I've mentioned this before on a webinar, but there's a photograph of me standing about 150 feet offshore on one of the lakes in the Lake District. It was that cold. The lakes froze over and you could you could walk over the corners of the lakes. And Rowley Regis in near Birmingham, it was um, 
very very cold something burnt a circle in her in the snow in her back garden she then claimed to meet these beings that came flying through her house that appeared to be to do with the light that had appeared outside uh, they were horrified when she lit up a cigarette. The case is known as the mince pie Martians because, amongst other things, she had leftover mince pies from Christmas and offered them to these alien beings. Gloriously surreal case. I have no idea what was going on there. But the if you assume that she had some kind of um, hypnagogic, hypnopompic experience, that doesn't explain the burnt circle in the snow in her garden. Something went on. Um, I've seen it explained as the electronic phenomena, i.e. something like ball lightning descended in the garden and caused her something akin to an epileptic fit with her, but she didn't say that's what happened. Point I'm making is that William James' big picture suggests that we're contacted in ways we barely understand and the most bizarre things happen to us. And his model better fits these than the so-called ETH, the intelligent aliens landing on the Earth, right? I don't think Diane walsh Pasulka would consider herself uh, a ufologist, but for my money, she's made some of the most significant progress in most recent years. She's what I'm claiming on the left-hand side there, right? Um, she was a writer and an academic, but increasingly she's she, she's dragged into places that normally people who teach religious studies are not dragged into quite a bit of popular stuff. And it all started, <clears throat> I mean, that, that's her background there. It all started when the book that's disappearing off the top there, American Cosmic. Um, <clears throat> this is a sort of history of her writing about not exactly UFOs, but belief in aliens. She's a professor of religious studies. She's interested in religious experience in people and why it happens and what's really going on. So she ended up amongst us, partly by by accident. I mean, as I say there, American Cosmic. Um, she discovered that the level of belief in aliens, i.e. that there were intelligent aliens contacting the Earth, was roughly equivalent to the number of people in America who believed in God. And American Cosmic is pretty much what I'm claiming there, then. It's, um, it's a professor of religious studies attempting to figure out why the same levels of belief would go with, with aliens and belief in God. So she goes to the people that she thinks are most likely to be illuminating on this. Specifically, her ethnographic study goes to high performing professional people, people like her. And she's asking them, are you serious about this? You know, what is it that convinces you? If I'm not convinced that aliens have landed, why are you convinced? And American Cosmic is one of the best books written from that perspective in the history of ufology. Encounters, which is the more recent book, as I put it there in, in the inverted commas, it is sharing the work of experts across a spectrum of fields who are working to connect humanity with unknown life forms. So here's a take out uh, away from encounters, which I didn't know until I read it. Um, I mean, I was, I was well aware that there are academics in America who are seriously considering how we would communicate with alien intelligences. The point being intelligences as and when we found evidence of them. Um, and at one point in Encounters, she discusses something that happened in the United States in the not too distant past, that some of the some of the academics who were involved in this study thought it would be a good idea to go and talk to um, leading people in like the, the first peoples, i.e. basically Native American communities and other people who came from kind of first peoples communities like australian aboriginals and stuff like that so they the idea was well, we'll go and talk to these people because their traditions are about there being consciousness in the earth you know i.e they almost did it in a patronizing way how do they think about talking to rocks and animals and you know how do they think about talking to the atmosphere and all the rest of it and because these are Western academics and what's discussed in encounters is that when this first happened in the United States, um, the particularly the Native Americans and the academics working with the Native Americans got back to the formal academics and said, do you not get this? <laughs> As in, what is wrong with you people? 
do you not get it's all alive yeah you know it's their response was to say the arrogant kind of western academic mindset is just discounting intelligences that are out there the whole time anyway um and it's interesting uh i hadn't realized that 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 kind of stand-up occurred and i, I would give some honorable mentions here if you want to look into this sort of side of it more john c Lilly was one of the original he was one of the people at the green bank observatory in 1961 when the first meeting was convened by Frank Drake that set up what is now SETI. And there, I mean, the whole bunch of people that, a whole bunch, of, there was a small, significant bunch of people there, people who are known to this day. So, for example, Enrico Fermi uh, was the person who asked, well, if there's so much life in the universe, where is everybody? The first person to break ranks with that team was a guy called John C. Lilly. Uh, now, his life is a study in itself. You know, we're talking. LSD experiments, him converting a house so that humans and dolphins could live together. Cracking stuff. There's a there's a there is a superb biopic yet to be made, I think, about John C. Lilly. But it's interesting because John C. Lilly was a Western scientist who sort of got into that kind of same thinking as the Native Americans, except in his case, he broke with the SETI people very early because he he came up with what his argument was crudely. If we want to understand how to communicate with an intelligence that is completely unlike ours, it would be far better to spend time and resources talking to dolphins than it would be to talk to hypothetical alien intelligences, i.e. we would be better enabled to do that if we started with dolphins, which are clearly way more intelligent than we understand and probably have awareness that in in a nature that we don't understand and john c Lilly was almost certainly right because more recent studies of dolphins and and pods that strand suggest that there's a significant difference that that pods of dolphins don't see themselves as individuals they perceive a pod almost like it's an entity in itself and again if you wanted to google the work of gerrit for who was a kind of pupil of, of Lilly, he wrote a book about searching for aliens as in the kind of aliens we'd understand but also discussed a lot about the need to deal with dolphins um it's a self-published book called is anyone out there which came out a few years ago i would thoroughly recommend it if you find that particular area of endeavor quite interesting yeah and speaking of two book wonders uh two significant ufo books but he does this guy is not a ufologist you may well be aware of abby Lobb, right so that's a CV and you know, just <laughs> that's a kind of that's a CV that says, look upon my works and weep, you know, um, amongst other things. If you read his first UFO related book, he just casually mentions along the way that he's got his mate Stephen Hawking around for dinner, as you do, you know. Um, so whatever you think about Abby Loeb and he's taken a, a something of an outlier in the scientific community now so most of the SETI people think he's going in the wrong direction but on the other hand like a lot of significant scientists who are now kind of emeritus he's going in the direction he always felt he should be going in regardless of what anybody else thinks he's good for his career I think he's career-wise he's made his point uh, and this is more or less where he is and again I would argue he's making a significant contribution to ufology in a couple of ways, which we'll come to in a second. But this is the sort of overview. Um, interstellar is the point where he breaks with most of his more rank and file scientific colleagues because he thinks that a Muir Muir, and if you're unfamiliar with a Muir Muir, again, worth a Google, but we're talking about a an unusual object that came in and out of our solar system at the back end of 2017. And Abby Loeb, is one of a number of people who thinks that it was a an object manufactured by an intelligent alien race and the evidence in inverted commas for this is that when this thing went around the sun it didn't do what anybody expected so it didn't behave exactly the way an asteroid would behave and it didn't behave exactly the way a comet would behave it's known as a muir muir which is um it's a hawaiian word meaning scout and it was given that name because it was first detected by an observatory in Hawaii. So they gave it the name and it was not, we could have probably learned more about it than we did. It was not taken particularly seriously. It was simply being tracked on its way to the sun as it entered the solar system. 
Um, and it wasn't until it went round the sun and didn't meet expectations that anybody took it, thought that there was anything unusual there. Now, there's a whole other bunch of possibilities which are nothing to do with it being a manufactured alien artifact, which I don't want to go into. The point I'm making is that Avi Loeb thinks it was. Um, and I'd argue that as a scientist with the CV that I showed you on the previous slide, you know, we should at least take his opinion seriously. Uh, his more recent book, Extraterrestrial, as it says there, really argues the value of a couple of things he's working on at the moment. First of all, the Galileo project, which again might unlikely that it will be um, the James Webb Space Telescope to finding alien life. But the Galileo project crudely is it concerns itself with near Earth objects and objects that crash on the Earth. So we're you know we we get meteorites impacting on the Earth. But the point now is that we've got the technology to track them coming in, we can spot objects, significant objects that come in, we can make useful guesses from things like the colour of the trails as they burn up as to what, what, what they're actually made up of. Avi Loeb thinks that there may be just random alien hardware out there which is impacting on the Earth, and by and large we don't even think to look for it. Um, so the, the whole point of the Galileo project is that it's using all the means you might expect from literally just tracking stuff in space to filming it on the way in to try and recover some of the more interesting objects because potentially that will be the first proof we've got that there is intelligence out there and the way that we would the way Avi Loeb imagines this happening and clearly he both imagines this happening and he also imagines him being front and center when it does happen and this being the absolute you know the high point of his scientific career despite the fact he's now retired from his, his main day job if we retrieved a meteorite or something that looked like a meteorite and we discovered clear evidence that the metals in there have been manufactured or whatever then it at that point all bets are off um and i I'd say he's a he's a good ufologist because he comes at it from a very high base of scientific interrogation, albeit probably also from a, a point of having more belief in these things than most of his colleagues ever would. But secondly, uh, I just completely randomly, I was on Isha Patel's podcast. If you're unfamiliar with Isha Patel, again, worth a Google. Uh, Isha Patel is interested in cosmic consciousness and preparing us to contact aliens and will help you to do that should you wish to do it. Um, you know, and is first and foremost somebody she's out there effectively um, leading us into that particular higher consciousness. So you can join that journey if you want. But on the other hand, she's got a podcast. And we'll talk to anybody and everybody within reason who's got opinions on this subject, whether they agree with her or not. Uh, and I, I was on a, a, was on a webinar, I can't remember, earlier this year, I think, possibly the end of last year. But just coincidentally, about two or three uh, episodes before me, she'd been talking to Avi Loeb. So he's, for all his scientific background, he will engage with, you know, he will actually go out and talk to the UFO crowd about what he believes, and he'll do it through the same means as the rest of us, somebody's webinar or similar. This guy definitely doesn't see himself as a ufologist. This is Philip Goff, and again, he's, he's I'm holding these academics up because whilst they might have fringe beliefs, I've deliberately gone for academics who are by nobody's definition also runs. Philip Goff, Associate Professor at the University of Durham. So if you don't quite make it into Oxford or Cambridge, Durham would be a pretty good second like plan B, right? So you, it's not like they will just employ anybody to be an Associate Professor in Durham. And he's young enough to be upwardly mobile. So at that point, he's a serious academic. He's also uh, somebody who is probably the leading advocate in the UK at the moment for panpsychism or panagentalism. Um, effectively, the notion that everything in the universe has consciousness, i.e. Con consciousness exists as part of the glue that holds the universe together. Therefore, we might be misguided 
to try and find the bit in our brain, the sum of parts in our brain that amounts to consciousness. I mean, we know, for example, that consciousness, the way we experience it in our brains, um, involves the interaction of different parts of the brain, including the cerebellum. The significance of that being it's a part of a brain that we share with the most much, much simpler life forms. So the bits of the brain that were evolved in primates are not the totality of, of how we experience consciousness. Consequently, there's some evidence that consciousness, we've possibly underestimated the level of consciousness in other animals. But Philip Goff's take on it is way, way bigger than that. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that's the question I'm putting there, basically, is something that he put out in um philosophy now in 2017 <clears throat> what then is the intrinsic nature of matter panpsychism offers an answer consciousness consciousness is in everything according to him consequently if you want to put two and two together to make a sort of five uh, until it's proven better if consciousness is in everything and we interact with everything it may be that these random high strangeness cases in whichever manner of paranormal manifestation they come ghosts or ufo contact or whatever um are actually just explosions of, of they're just us acting with consciousness and almost interpreting it in the way we think we should but more significantly um he wrote this book recently um what he's talking about here is teleological panpsychism. Crudely, it's the notion that there is consciousness in the universe, but it's not just random. It might be working towards a purpose, a purpose so big and complicated that we cannot begin to understand it, but we can see the evidence of it working towards that. I mean, if you wanted a kind of, you know, a sort of beginner's pool, i.e. this is, to get into Philip Goff's arguments, it's, it's, you know, it's almost like you're diving into the Olympic pool here, but uh, conveniently, in the not-too-distant past, Philip Goff turned up on In Our Time, the uh, BBC Radio 4 programme, where three academics and Melvin Bragg spent 45 minutes arguing the toss about whether panpsychism was a thing. Um, Philip Goff is the greatest advocate. They've got somebody who's kind of agnostic, but more or less with him. And then they've got a, a complete sceptic on there as well. And it's it's that episode has not long gone on to the, you can just help yourself to a download. Um, but he's not a ufologist. It's just my contention would be that he might, if there's anything in his arguments, and crudely his argument comes down to this, that physics went wrong from Galileo onwards that the notion that you can explain everything in equations and understanding matter is wrong um and that the that effectively physics now needs philosophy because the high strangeness levels we're getting to now where you've got things and you don't know whether they behave as a, you know, whether it's a particle or a wave and um you know the the search for these mythical particles and search for dark matter and the search for trying to understand why the universe is the way it is his argument would be if we throw consciousness in we get closer to what are probably the answers than if we just keep throwing maths at it um i wouldn't presume to know i mean my, my background is humanities but on the other hand i find his arguments interesting if only because they seem to provide a way into the thing i keep colliding with when i when I've done a live talk, particularly in a room or something, where you're faced with somebody who's telling you the most surreal, bizarre thing that ever happened to them, and it makes no logical sense whatsoever, but you cannot deny how sincere they are. Panpsychism potentially is a way into that, all right? Um, and interestingly, it might fit one or two of the more bizarre UFO cases. If you're unfamiliar with this, uh, it's the recent Netflix series on mysteries. The first episode is on the Pascagoula abduction case of 1973. It's significant in the history of ufology for a reason that people don't realise. J. Allen Hynek, who was probably the greatest ufologist who ever lived and was the guy who gave us the definition, you know, coined the term close encounters and then gave us the grades of close encounter. 
he was originally involved in flying saucer and UFO studies as a government paid skeptic. He was his job was to turn up as a significant academic and debunk a lot of this stuff, and which he successfully did because a lot of it was exactly what he claimed it to be. But fundamentally, two cases convinced him that there was more to it. One of them was the Father Gill case from 1959 in Papua New Guinea. The other one was the Pascagoula abduction. And what happened was that two guys who were fishing on a dock in Pascagoula, obviously, um, claimed to have the most bizarre UFO experience. That's a picture drawn by one of them, Calvin Parker, who's the guy in the middle. Um, sorry, that's Charlie Hickson, the guy in the middle. He was the older one of the two. Um, and one reason the police who dealt with them initially didn't think the thought the two of them were hoaxes was because this whole thing had happened in full view of a bunch of toll gates on a road and none of the toll gate workers reported seeing anything but one of the most bizarre instances one of the most bizarre facts about this case is that the police were so convinced they were dealing with hoaxes they secretly tape recorded the two witnesses and left them alone in a room and what happened was they spoke to each other. They were clearly traumatized. They were clearly sharing the same story. At no point did they indicate they'd done anything other than experience this the way that they claimed to the police. Um, it completely, the, dealing with these witnesses and Father Gill completely changed um, Alan Hynek's mind, or perhaps more accurately, was a tipping point. Uh, you know, he he became more and more convinced that we should, I think as he once explained it in a documentary, um, we should maybe find the truth as we wouldn't expect it. Um, I don't know. I mean, it may be that Philip Goff's arguments take us closer to understanding this than anything else I can present at the moment. The point I'm making is that he's a philosopher. He believes in panpsychism. It might be a way into some of the more high strangeness cases. This is a high strangeness case. And also this guy, this, this is James Webb. Now you might be familiar with the James Webb Space Telescope, but that's on the left. Your man on the right is James Webb. Again, technically speaking, NASA and James Webb are not ufologists. They're simply scientists who keep on trying to devise better and better means of understanding what's out there in the cosmos. Uh, I think they're a good yardstick against UFO claims because at the moment there's a kind of race on it. I can't prove this to you, but I think one reason why there's so much pressure from ufologists and public pressure in the United States for these congressional hearings is quite simple. There's probably a fear among some people in the UFO community, particularly over there, that NASA are going to beat them to it. Um, because the James Webb Space Telescope is getting to the point of detecting exoplanets, and we're currently in a situation where one of them, K218b, is providing enough interest to suggest that it may just have life on it, i.e. has got a biosignature, possibly. I mean, it may, it may well not, but on the other hand, we're just getting better and better at doing this. So this is UFO investigation done the way that it's always been done. Uh, it's just that they never, people like NASA never claim themselves to be ufologists. They're first and foremost, these are scientists and engineers trying to help us understand more about space. Um, I suppose I'd, the point I'd make about this is that I think I struggle with the huge conspiracy theories about the fact that the moon landings were faked and that um, America has had secrets in hangars for years. I don't know. I mean, in a way, I'd, I'd love to be wrong about that. I would love the congressional hearings to lead to a hangar opening up and some alien artefact indisputable alien artifact being produced i don't think it's going to happen for all that i'm as big a sucker as anybody else so i was busy watching david grush testifying to congress live online as it was happening and i was getting i was loving it up until the point at which he mentioned mussolini's aliens and the 1933 alleged landing of a ufo in italy and i've got to be honest that was <laughs> that was almost visceral my heart sank um, because anybody who's been involved in ufology for any significant amount of time knows that that case actually only dates from the 1990s and was a 
was a hoax effectively put out to UFO magazines in Italy in about 1996. And one of the giveaways is how much it resembles the um, the infamous MJ-12 documents. I just think there's a point hidden in plain sight. Why the hell, if America had hard and fast proof of alien intelligence, why spend the billions of dollars that up to and including the James Webb Space Telescope and everybody who's involved with it? All right. So almost there. Timothy Good said, if there's a subject that needs rescue, and it's this one, right? Is just last point on this. Does anybody out there watching tonight have a Bufora membership card? If you have, go and get it. Stick your, your camera on. Let's see it. I'm just having a sip of tea. My guess is we we could sit here till tomorrow morning. I, I don't believe I'm going to see one. Um, Bufora exists in name only, right? One reason why I think the people that I've shown you tonight matter is because at the moment, particularly in this country, you can't join Bufora. I know because when I joined ASAP, I also tried to join Bufora. Uh, which actually kicked off quite an in, in, interesting little lively debate. Um, I, without naming names, I've spent a lot of time talking to one member of Euphoria who seemed quite keen that I joined them. Um, the problem is you can't join them. <laughs> so what do you do? <laughs> um, it, it's a handful of people who have been there quite a long time, and they're the remnants of what used to be a, quite a big organisation. There was a time when these guys, Andy, uh, the, the two male guys there at the camera, Andy Roberts and Dave Clark were members and it, Andy Roberts, I mean, it, it's it, the, the falling apart of Britain's biggest UFO dedicated organisation is chronicled in the Armchair Ufologist, which was an interesting publication because you couldn't subscribe to it. It would just literally turn up. I was lucky enough to be one of the recipients, so I know what was in it. And it was kind of like private eye, but it was a just concerning itself with UFOs, basically, with ufology um, and what everything that was going wrong with it. And fair play to Andy, he was absolutely on the money. He was warning that if he, effectively, if Britain's UFO investigators didn't bury their egos and start investigating UFOs, it was all going to end in tears. And it did. Um, so I'm assuming, I'm not seeing anybody's camera showing me a before a membership card. Last call. Okay, I rest my case. Um, so a significant business guru here, uh, Joe Tight, said, culture more than products or services is what differentiates an organisation from competitors, both in the minds of customers and of employees. So excuse me, but one reason I would argue to you that some of the people who are not ufologists who've made contributions from other areas are at the moment the most significant makers of progress in UFO investigation is because to a large extent, I would, I would say that um, the Wikipedia, which damns ufology as a pseudoscience, may have a point. It may be that the people most investigating UFOs from the perspective of being paranormal or UFO investigators don't apply the best methods and consequently we don't always make the best progress in that direction. And it's interesting, I, don't, I can't, I'm going to tell you something I which is a hunch now and I can't prove but when I was looking at the way that the wiki for, for this publication and for this chapter I've just been writing on the book this week um I thought well that's a bit, bit harsh on ufology um and I went and looked at the way that the wikipedia deals with other fringe beliefs and it's interesting it's if anything the wikipedia which it sees itself as very liberal minded and you know out there for everybody um it's, it's way more damning about UFOs than, than, for example, whether Elvis is alive. I um, mean, clearly Elvis isn't alive, but the page on whether Elvis is alive is a very matter-of-fact consideration of all the people who've said he is and what they've claimed. And it just lets you go and do your own investigations. My hunch, which I can't prove, is that Wikipedia editors are fed up with dealing with ufologists who keep trying to change the page and claim that all sorts of things are going on that they can't stand up so i think it's i think their tetchiness the tetchiness of the wikipedia editors is leaking out and i think it's possibly indicative of 
you know, what's driving the UFO investigation from the inside, i.e. the people who think that they're ufologists. OK, I think I've ranted enough. I trust that that little whistle stop tour has given you things that you might want to Google. Uh, I suppose it's time for questions now, if anybody's still standing. Oh, definitely still standing, Neil. Thank you very much for that. I much appreciated. I see that Stu has uh, he's jumped away, so he's taking uh, he says he's got to take a telephone call. So uh, okay. I guess it's you and me having a bit of a chat. We're going to go down the uh, the questions in a second. Uh, thank you very much for that. It was a uh, euphology is a kind of place in my heart as well. So uh, thank you very much for your fascinating talk tonight. And it actually, uh, there was a lot of things here that honestly perhaps had gone over my head, and I was like, oh, got to go flag that up. I've got to go check that. And actually, that's exactly what I want from a talk like this. I'll be able to look at something and actually go and uh, learn a little bit more. And hopefully everyone has taken uh, away something from this this talk tonight. Uh, in terms of the questions down here, um, I think because the way you explain things in such a way that is uh, dynamic and it is interesting, it fills the topic really quite quickly as to how you've got to your certain point on every one of your slides. The questions didn't roll in until much, much later. So it's very interesting there. So it shows that you, uh, you are a man of the subject. So, well... It, it, either that or it shows that I'm just banging on in a cul-de-sac. I don't feel I am. I mean, but but on the other hand, can I go back to an original point before we get to the questions? Sure. I watched Paul Gledhill's talk, so this is the alternative. I don't disagree with Paul. Um, I'm just, I was very carefully avoiding the material that he covered very well a few weeks ago. Consequently, yeah. this is everything. If you like, this is the parallel universe in which all these other things are going on that might be contributing to our understanding as well. Sure. So John Kane says, surely the man most at the centre of the UFO study is John Keel. He certainly has his historical perspective. Would you throw John Keel on this list or would you think he's already? No, so can we, can we be clear about this? Whilst I've been a bit, I think, I think the Wikipedia is right. And I think the Wikipedia's kind of semi peer reviewed status is right. I think, to call ufology a pseudoscience is fair, but that doesn't mean that everybody that was ever involved in ufology is a pseudoscientist. Because if I'm saying that, that's you and me damned as well, isn't it, Christian? <laughs> sure, for sure. Um, so uh, beyond which, um, I think there are, yes, John, if I was going to pick, let, let's just throw the scientific method out for a minute. My favourite ufologists include John Keel, yeah? Um, and my favourite, I've read the Mothman Prophecies three or four times in my life, and it's still a great book. So um, I think Keel was absolutely onto something because he was very allowing of the kind of the uncanny coincidences and the notion that it might be that, that we might be being led somewhere we can barely understand. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I get that. So, I mean. <laughs> If there's anything in the panpsychism, for example, then the Mothman prophecies makes more sense. And if, if people are looking in and they don't understand what I'm saying, the gist of it is a lot of weird things are happening in a place called Point Pleasant in Michigan. John Keel is a science based but journalist with an interest in the paranormal is called in. Weird things happen, including to him. They all seem to be leading somewhere. Nobody has a clue. And then at the end of all of this, a bridge collapses in the town and there are people killed. Yeah. And. It all, it's almost as if all these things were a premonition that nobody understood. Yeah? It's almost like there's an intelligence trying to get to you in the most bizarre ways, and you don't know what the hell is going on. And yet, actually, in retrospect, it kind of makes sense. And, and Keel was one of the ufologists who was much more of that persuasion than just the notion that we can say exactly it's this lot from Zeta Reticuli and they're abducting us. Yeah? And I, I, I love him for that. Got you. I get you. So there's a comment here from uh, Dave Sivier. Uh, so way back in 1920, a New Zealand physicist suggested that there was a particle of mind, a midian. Um, I believe that's how you pronounce it. Similar to electrons and protons. Mm -hmm. Do you think something like that, that kind of quantity could exist? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that the panpsychists and their ilk are actually... It's an interesting one because the, the leading panpsychists are by and large philosophers. So they're not scientists, but their argument is that science has given them the evidence for that, which is a century on from humanity in New Zealand, is 
it's where we are now because we've got better ways of detecting those particles. So I don't, I don't think that particle exists, but I think that the thinking behind that might have been more credible than people gave it any credit for at the time. Okay, I get, get, I get what you're saying with that. So Rob Gandhi says a question for Neil: What fancy dress will you wear when you go when you watch Carlisle at Derby on Saturday? An alien. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. <laughs> I absolutely won't. I, I, I don't. I, I tend not to discuss football when I'm on these things, but just for most people aren't football fans. It's a tradition among, if you're listening and you don't know what the hell that's about, it's a tradition among football fans that you wear fancy dress if you go away on the last game of the season, right? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what the Carlisle fans are wearing. I thought I'd Google it. My guess is that they're going to go as sheep um, because apart from anything else, we're playing away at Derby County or the Rams. But seriously, I, don't, I tend I tend not to do it, but I love the guys who do. And my top moment on that is that a few seasons ago, I mean, this, this season's been tragic, so we're dead and buried and we've nothing to play for and we are relegated. There's nothing we can do, so we might as well have a good time. But um, a few seasons ago, the best moment for me was I turned up at a pub in Stevenage ahead of our last game of the season and the place was full of Andy Pandys. I mean, seriously, I... I I was talking to a footballer who lives two doors down the road from me earlier on tonight, and it's on my to-do list. I don't know why. I, the creator of Andy Pandy must come from Stevenage, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, probably there will be some fancy dress there. I will share it with you, Rob. I'll, I'll get some photographs and I'll let you know. <laughs> well, that really kind of draws up our questions, really. I guess you, as a... As a... All the rest of the replies are, thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you for a great talk. Interesting. And I think you have, you know, you've hit many of the points that allow us to go away and explore many of these uh, topics, these characters. I mean, I literally, while we were talking, I literally went and bought Garrett's book, uh, UFO, uh, in the background on Audible. So I will oh, listen to that in, uh, over the next few weeks or so, because I'd like to get into that, listening to that. Um, so actually, uh, Aislinn McCrodden has made a comment here where it says, uh, that was an amazing talk. I'm a skeptic when it comes to an alien visitor. Even though Independence Day was my all-time favourite movie, this has been fascinating. Um, I think uh, you mentioned um, a date earlier on in your presentation. Perhaps I think it was the first date you put up. And actually, that was my comment that I'm pretty sure that uh, May of 1996 actually is when Independence Day was going through its promotional cycle at that time. I possibly, I don't, um, I don't think it's, I'm not sure that's particularly pertinent to Timothy Good. I, I tell you what's pertinent to Timothy Good because if I'm sure I'm not the only one on the call tonight on the on the webinar tonight who can remember this, but there was a sweet spot between the X Files becoming ubiquitous, um, digital publishing meaning that everything was cheaper, and before the internet kicked in, and quite a few of us quite a few of us made reasonable money writing or speaking about UFOs at that point or the paranormal until the internet kind of slaughtered it. And I think the day in Timothy Good's case then is significant because when the world and his dog was going mad for UFO books, which was partly off the 50th anniversary of Roswell coming up and partly because the X-Files was massive, uh, it would have been a no-brainer, really, that his publisher would have rung him up and said, can you not update Above Top Secret, and we'll call it Beyond Top Secret. <laughs> and that was the book he was promoting at the time. I mean, had I been him, and I'd have thought, you know, this is an even better... I wish I'd... There was eight years between the two books, but effectively, he just reinvented the same book and got out there and absolutely milked it, you know, because the, the market conditions were such that he could do that. Do you think now it's just an oversaturated market with any kind of uh, suggestion of like ghost and ufology? Uh, sorry, ghost UFOs. You can literally make, you can go to ChatGPT and tell it to write a book for you. Um, and there's lots of self published books I see on Amazon quite often with no real depth or detail any longer. Uh, tell me about it, yes. But speaking of somebody who spent this afternoon trying to write a chapter in a UFO book, there is a bit of like, why well, the hell am I bothering? But, you know, one of the reasons I ducked out of it in, I say ducked out of it, I never stopped caring and never stopped paying attention. But from the late 90s onwards for about 20 odd years, um, there was simply more money in writing about football and rock music and other things. And it was, you know, if um, at the beginning of that period, I was still paying off a mortgage. So it was a no brainer, really. Um, I, I think it's worth doing it if you care, which is why I would presume to turn up at the seriously strange weekend and hang about with everybody and 
and bang on about the fact that it matters that we all stick at this because um yeah you're right there is increasingly rubbish out there and ai will only make that situation worse but it doesn't mean that we're we're done with things to discover i mean i think one reason i would assume that everybody's in asap is that if we share one faith it's that there are still mysteries out there to be explained and the beauty of like the paranormal that we're interested in is that it's still a place where amateurs can make a difference i mean if, if you like that all these people tonight i've mentioned who aren't ufologists they're chipping bits off the argument the whole time but it still leaves things that the rest of us would presume to go and look into um you know and long may that continue and if if you're writing books for fewer people then you know it probably means that the only people left doing it seriously will be people who really care so that's a that that won't go away it's just it'll be squeezed more to the margins no i like that so i i can see you've got your details up on the screen do you want to just share your social media details anything your website wise if anyone wants um, to contact with well, you so I, I stick my website up because it's the same reason I mention it in my radio show. To be brutally honest, I'm buried in email. But if I know it, it if I spot one that's come through the website, I take it seriously. <laughs> so if anybody wants a serious chat, contact me through the website because that's got a contact facility, which goes into my personal email. And I pick those ones up when I'm ignoring everybody else's, right? Um, other than that, I'm, I'm on Facebook. If anybody's bothered about it, um, you know, and I quite happily banter about the paranormal when I'm doing that kind of thing. Other than that, I, you know, I'll, I'll see quite a lot of people at Seriously Strange Weekend, and I'm, there's, there are fewer pleasures better than talking about the paranormal whilst sharing a beer, basically. Honestly, you won't get any argument from me there. Okay, <laughs> so we'll, we'll draw this to a close then. Hopefully this will be uh, available this evening via, like, a... Uh, by YouTube and all the bit shoot and rumble and stuff, and it'll be available as an audio podcast very soon. So thank you very much for joining us here tonight, Neil. And uh, for everyone, I'm, I honestly, I don't know who's uh, coming up next week. Uh, CJ, I'm sure you've had a good night when he gets to see this. But uh, we shall draw it to a close here tonight, and uh, see you next time. Thank Take you very much, everybody, for sticking around. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, all.